In this video, we're going to implement a Navier Stokes solver using the Phoenix finite element package in Python. We will discuss the weak forms as well as their implementation. Then we will code down our simulation loop, including a consideration for linear algebra solvers and implement an interactive visualization. Let's get started. And welcome to this new video. The Navier-Stokes equation are a set of partial differential equations that describe the evolution of fluid flow. I have them given here. They consist of momentum equation. These are two differential equations in the two-dimensional case for our velocity components u as well as an incompressibility constraint which requires us to conserve mass. In this video, we want to use finite elements, which is a discretization method for spatial derivatives, as well as coherence projection, which is a technique in order to enforce incompressibility in order to solve those two. And in order to make the finite element implementation really easy, we're going to use the Phoenix Python package. The lid driven cavity is one of the simplest scenarios you can look at for Navier-Stokes equation. And it works like this, that we are in a unit square domain, so we have a two-dimensional domain where our domain extends from 0 to 1 in x direction and from 0 to 1 in y direction. And then inside this box we have a fluid at rest, so it's not moving. And then we have Dirichlet boundary conditions on each of the walls. So in the left, on the right and in the bottom we have a homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. That means that both velocity components shall be zero. And that of course means we have a wall such that our fluid cannot exit or enter the domain over these boundaries. And then at the top of our domain, we have something that you can think of as a moving wall. So there is a horizontal velocity in x direction, basically, which moves us to the right, but there is no velocity prescribed in y direction. And then by the fact that the top wall is moving to the right, and by the effects of diffusion, we will propagate this motion into our domain and over the time we will see a vortex being created somewhere around the center of our domain. In order to solve this using the Phoenix finite element package, we have to transform our partial differential equations into the weak form. And for this I first want to introduce some notation. So since we will be using a couple of intermediate steps, notation for a velocity field is kind of ambiguous because those exist at certain substeps. By u, I want to define the velocity field and in our transient simulation that is meant from the previous iteration in time. And of course, if we are in the zeroth iteration of time, that refers to the initial condition. But since we say that our velocity is zero throughout the domain, this initial condition is just a zero initial condition. Then by u star, I want to denote the velocity field after a tentative step. According to the coherence projection method, we will first solve the momentum equations without the pressure gradient and then we will get a velocity field which is at a future point in time but which does not respect incompressibility. So this velocity field could potentially delete or create mass out of nowhere. And that's of course not what we want. We rather want an incompressible field since this is the constraint given by the second partial differential equation and in order to enforce that we will do a correction step and the velocity after that is called u double star. Then by p star, I want to define the pressure field at the next time step. You can think of the pressure here as some sort of a pseudo pressure, which helps us enforce incompressibility. So we are not really interested in the transient evolution of pressure, but rather as a tool in order to make this current projection happen. Then we will use a simple Euler step in time. So we have a delta t time step size, which is also constant throughout our simulation. And we also need to introduce test functions these are just some tools in order to define our weak form. If you want more details on the weak form derivation, then please watch the next video in this playlist where we go over that in more detail. And here we need two test functions. So we need a V test function, which will be the test function in the function space of our velocity. And we also need a pressure test function, I want to denote by Q. 
And then the solution or our simulation strategy is rather straightforward. So we have three steps. First, we're going to solve the weak form for the momentum equation without the pressure gradient. That's the P1 pressure correction scheme or Corian projection scheme here. And by this, we're going to use the following engineering. So we treat the convection explicitly. So the convection is this term in our Navier-Stokes equation and the diffusion is going to be treated implicitly. So this one is this term in our momentum equation. And by the way, we will neglect the force term here since there are no volume forces applied in our domain. Okay, then we get the following weak form as said. Please watch the next video for more detail why it is the case it is. But I think it should be clear that one can see here some sort of a time stepping scheme. We have the difference between the tentative velocity and the previous velocity divided by the delta t. And these angular brackets here indicate an inner product. And an inner product in the case of finite element refers to an integral over the domain of the product of the two functions. So this is just a shorthand notation such that you don't have to use the cluttering integral. Then we have the contribution from the advection and convection. And here you see we only have use from the previous iteration in time, so without the star. And then here we have our diffusion where we treat the u at the next point in time. When we then solve this finite element problem using Phoenix, we get our u star which as said is not prospecting incompressibility. And in order to get a pseudo pressure, we will solve a pressure Poisson problem, which is given here for a pressure field at the next point in time. For this, we have to evaluate the divergence of U star, which can also be handily done with Phoenix. And then here we also see the other test functions Q from the function space of P. This on the left, by the way, is defining and Poisson problems. So this is the weak form of the Laplace operator that you also see in the diffusion in our momentum step. And if we then obtained a P star, we can correct our U star in order to get U double star. So this is just a simple correction here. So we will subtract the pressure gradient scaled by the delta T and then we get our U double star. There is one more note, which is a little bit technical. Here we have to use so-called Taylor hood elements. The problem with Navier-Stokes equation on top of all the other things with nonlinearity is that they form a so-called saddle point problem. This is a typical problem in mathematics, which usually brings up a lot of trouble. And in order to make our simulation feasible, we have to use so-called Taylor hood elements among some other strategy, but this is one of the most widely ones used in finite elements. This usage of the Taylor hood elements is avoiding something that you in finite volume discretization usually refer to as pressure or checkerboard oscillations. And those work in the way that we have to choose the ansatz or shape functions for our two spaces from different orders. And the pressure space has to be one order smaller than the function space. So here we're going to select function spaces and from those we are going to set our u's and v's and p's and q's. And the order for u for the velocity has to be one order higher than for the pressure we will see this in a second. It's super straightforward with Phoenix, but you have to be aware of this. Otherwise you get an instable simulation. And another point where you might get an instable simulation is if you don't choose a careful time step length, because here we're using an explicit treatment of convection advection. That is because um, this is done for simplicity, but just as a note here, if you, for instance, want to go to higher resolutions or make some other changes, also with regard to the Reynolds number, please be aware that this can lead to instabilities. Okay, then let's start with our implementation. I will go below the doc string, then let's first import Phoenix as FE for finite elements, because why not? Then I will also use TQDM as a simple progress meter. So from TQDM, import TQDM. Optional, you don't need that, but it's just handy to see the progress. Then I will also use import matplotlib.pyplotsplt in order to modify the visual styling of our animation. Then let's define some constants. So I want to use 41 points per axis. So this is going to define the mesh that we're going to use. 
This does not refer to the number of degrees of freedom here, since we have a finite element simulation. This is just the discretization of our mesh. Then I want to have a time step length of 0 0.01 and I want to perform 100 time steps and the kinematic viscosity is going to be 0 0.01 and in our unit square domain with a one boundary condition on the top that refers to a Reynolds number of 100. So that one is equal to a Reynolds number of 100. Then let's define a main function leave it empty and implement a name switch. So if name is equal main, and then our file is only executed with the Python interpreter. Then let's go to our main function and let's first define our mesh. And that is super straightforward because we're using one of the simplest meshes there are. And this is the unit square mesh which is defined in two dimensions. And we just have to provide how many discretization points we want in each of the axes. And here we also want to use an equal discretization in both axes. And this is instantiate a domain that goes from zero to one in both axes and is then discretized using 41 nodes, which gives us 40 finite elements in each of the axes. Then we need the function spaces. And I just want to write that down once again, because it is crucial for the stability. So we need so-called Tauler hood elements, which is a combination of the order of function spaces for pressure and velocity. So once again, the order of the function space for the pressure has to be one order lower than for the velocity. So then let's start with the velocity function space, which is going to be phoenix dot vector function space defined on our mesh with Lagrange elements because we just want to have the simplest elements possible. And now I want to be order two. Here it says decree. I mean, this is identical in that case. And then in order to get our Taylor hood elements, we will use a pressure function space base which shall be phoenix dot function space on the mesh with Lagrangian elements of order one. So we will have quadratic ansatz shape functions for the velocity and of course those define a vector function space so those are quadratic in both components of our velocity and then we have a scalar function space for the pressure, which is of order one. And then we can use our function spaces, so velocity and pressure function space, in order to define trial and test functions, which will be used within our weak form definitions. So we're going to have a U trial, which is going to be the trial function for the velocity in our velocity function space. So we will do phoenix dot trial function on the velocity function space. Then we have P trial, which is our trial function, or which in the end is defining our primary unknown in each of the weak forms. So if we look at here, then uh, this is always what I meant by solve for. This is always going to be the trial function then. And here the P trial is phoenix dot trial function on the pressure function space. Then we're going to have a V test which is a test function in the velocity space. So phoenix dot test function in the velocity function space. And then we have Q test, which is going to be phoenix dot test function on the pressure function space. And then before we can start with our weak form, I want to define the boundary condition. So define the boundary condition. And let me just recap that once again. So we are in our unit square domain and we have all Dirichlet boundary conditions and it is going to be homogeneous on the left, on the right and on the bottom and non-homogeneous on the top. So let's start with the homogeneous and I want to call this the stationary wall boundary condition. And for this we will use phoenix dot Dirichlet boundary condition and we will use the velocity function space. This is the function space we're in. And then let's define what the prescribed value shall be. And it's going to be zero, zero. And here we need two zeros because as said, we have a velocity function space, which is a vector space. And therefore we have to prescribe both vector entries. 
So zero velocity in X, zero velocity in Y direction. And then we're going to now do something that might sound a little bit weird at first, but we're going to write a string of C++ code. And I'll say, hey, we're doing Python. Why should we use C++ here? And of course, this is caused by the fact that a lot of things that Phoenix is doing for us is happening in C++. So we're just controlling it with Python. And here I want to write some low-level code which defines whether a point is on the boundary. And for this, we're going to use a Boolean that is called onBoundary. And this one shall be ended with a condition. Okay, weird, but let me, let me write that down for a second and I'll explain it again. And for this, we want to check whether the zero of component of our position X is smaller than zero. So we will be on a stationary wall if X zero is smaller than zero and we are on the boundary, but ignore this on boundary. So this is more relevant here. So once again, this will be, well, if this is our X direction and this is our Y direction, and if our position is smaller than zero, then we are on this left boundary. That's where we want to be and that shall be part of our stationary wall. I mean, now you might say, well, I mean, if we say smaller than zero, then technically we would be on the negative half and you're right. So this actually would not be zero. So maybe we should be using something like equal zero, but this is also problematic because we are working with floating point numbers and if we have some rounding errors, we might still be on the boundary, but uh, it might not technically be zero. So we will do something that works like this. So we say smaller than dolphin eps, dolphin epsilon. And this is just a small value. So for instance, 10 to the minus 14 or something like this. And it is such so small that all points that are smaller than that shall be on the boundary. So this is one of our three boundaries. Then I'm going to use a logical or. We we're going to say that x1 is smaller than dolphin eps. And that's, of course, if we go up, that's the bottom boundary. And then we have our right boundary. So I'm again using a logical or. And then we're going to say x0 is greater than 1.0 minus dolphin epsilon. And here, as said, this is a code in C++ and it basically says, hey, Phoenix, if we are on the boundary and we are on the left or on the bottom or on the right boundary, then we want to prescribe 0, 0 as homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. Let's do the same with the moving wall. So moving wall boundary condition is again a Dirichlet boundary condition on the velocity function space. And here we now have a 1.0 in X direction and a 0.0, .0 in Y direction. And here our C++ string shall be, again, we use the on boundary Boolean and then end it with the condition of X1 being greater than 1.0 minus dolphin epsilon. And this is of course referring to the top wall. And then let's just collect these two into the list of velocity boundary conditions. So velocity boundary conditions. And that's just a list of the stationary wall BC and the moving wall BC. And at last, we can now start with the weak form. But before we can write that down, I want to first define the solution fields involved. So define the solution fields involved and these are also going to be the variables in which we going to save all the unknowns so basically the solutions of each of the um, solutions to the weak forms that we have and you have to kind of differentiate between these functions and the trial or test functions that we already defined in that these are going to be actual functions and not just helpers in order to define the weak form Although, of course, they will also be used within the weak form since we have this time causality that we have to involve here such that we use information from the previous iteration. Okay, so we're going to have a u previous, which is going to be phoenix.function on the velocity function space. And then we will have u tentative, which is also a function on the velocity function space. And we're going to have u next, which is also a function on the velocity function space. And you can think of this as this is u, 
this is u star and this is u double star. And then we have p next, which is a function on the pressure function space. And this is going to be p star. And Phoenix is instantiating these solution fields with zeros. So we also have our zero initial condition. Finally, let's start with the weak form of the momentum equation. And I want to define this in residual form, similar to how we had it here, such that we have a zero on the left hand side of our equation. So this gives us the momentum weak form residuum. And this one is going to be an expression which goes over multiple lines. Um, so I'm using uh, this bracket notation here. And then let's look at it. So first we have one divided by delta t times the inner product of the difference of the tentative or the trial in that sense, minus the values from the previous iteration with the test function. So it's going to be 1.0 divided by the time step length multiplied with the inner product of u trial. So the unknown in that equation minus u previous. So the values from the previous iteration in time. And then we have to inner product that with the test function. And then we have to integrate that over the domain. So we will do finite element phoenix.dx. So that's the first component. So that's the transient part in the momentum. Then we have the next, which is by the convection. So we will have gradient of u multiplied with u multiplied with v in the inner product. And then also we have to integrate. So we will get a plus and then phoenix dot inner product of phoenix dot gradient on u previous multiplied with u previous and v test. And then we have to integrate that over the domain. So multiply it with phoenix.dx. Okay, that's the second part. Let's go to the last part, which is our diffusion. So we add the climatic viscosity multiplied with the inner product of the gradient of u trial and the gradient of the test function. So we will have plus kinematic viscosity multiplied with phoenix.inner product of phoenix.gradient of u trial and phoenix.gradient of v test and then integrated over the domain so multiplied with phoenix.vx. This residuum form can then be transformed into a left hand side and right hand side. That's because here we have a linear discretized form. So we will have momentum weak form left hand side LHS is going to be phoenix.left hand side on the momentum weak form residuum. And then let's do the same with the right hand side by saying phoenix dot right hand side of momentum residuum. And left hand side refers to the collection of all the unknowns. So everything that has U trial in it goes to the left hand side and everything that doesn't have U trial in it goes to the right hand side. Okay, great. That's the momentum equation. Let's have the weak form of the pressure Poisson problem. And here I want to directly define that in left hand side and right hand side. So we can go up and see on the left hand side, we have the inner product of the gradient of our P next or the P trial in that sense and the gradient of our test function in the pressure space. So we will have pressure Poisson weak form left hand side is going to be phoenix dot inner product on phoenix dot gradient of p trial and phoenix dot gradient of u test integrated over the domain so multiplied with phoenix dot dx and for the right hand side we have the inner product of the divergence of the tentative velocity field with the test function in the pressure space and then we scale that by minus one over delta t. So let's go down here and then we get the pressure Poisson weak form right hand side is going to be phoenix dot inner but let's first do the scaling so minus one divided by time step length so here we go and then the and of course we need a multiplication here and then we have the inner product. Well, we actually do not have the inner product here. So because we have scalars and that makes sense because uh, 
Well, I mean, of course, we are in the pressure space here. And if we take the divergence of the U stars of a velocity field, we get a scalar field, vector to scalar field. And then, of course, this one here is just the integration over the domain without an inner product because we don't have to contract dimensions. So we can ignore the phoenix inner actually and just do phoenix dot divergence on the u tentative multiply that with the q test and integrate over the domain finally let's define the weak form of the velocity update equation so we will have velocity update weak form left hand side which here let's go up and check that so here we will have u double star and v in the inner product but here we need the inner product again within the integral so because we contract the dimensions down to scalars so let's do that and have phoenix dot inner on phoenix dot gradient on u trial multiplied with phoenix dot gradient on the test times phoenix dot dx in case you're asking why we can use u trial again is because these are just helpers in order to define weak forms those aren't actual solutions so those are kind of detached from different weak forms then we have the velocity update weak form right hand side and this will again span over multiple lines so first we're going to have the inner product and we again need also an inner product construction here of the tentative with the test function so we will be having phoenix dot inner on u tentative and v test integrated over the domain and when we subtract time step length multiplied with the inner product well Let's check that again. So that's here the inner product of the gradient of P star with the test function on V. Phoenix dot gradient on P next and V test and then integrate over the domain. And I see I made a small mistake. Probably you catch that, that we shouldn't be having the gradient here. So for the velocity update, there is no Laplace equation, obviously. And I think that should match with, yes, with the definition as we have it up here. Beautiful. Well, then let's go on into our time loop. So let's have our simulation loop by saying for t in range of n time steps. And I want to use tqdm in order to visualize the progress. Well, and then the first step is to solve for the tentative velocity. So solve for tentative velocity and we will use the convenience routine phoenix dot solve and say solve the variational problem which is given by momentum left hand side is equal to momentum weak form right hand side so the equality operator is just overloaded by phoenix and that just means it is an equation a weak form of pde defined by a left hand side and a right hand side and it should save the solution into u tentative so this basically means well solve the problem and then write out the solution into u tentative while respecting the velocity boundary conditions given by our list and that's actually the first step super easy right then the next step is to solve for the pressure by our pressure poisson problem so we will do phoenix dot solve on the pressure poisson weak form left hand side is equal to the pressure poisson weak form right hand side and please save the solution into p next here we don't have any boundary conditions we don't have these artificial Neumann boundary conditions that you might see in some finite difference discretizations. Then we can use P next in order to correct our velocities. So correct the velocities to be incompressible. And here we will do Phoenix solve and have the velocity update weak form left hand side is equal to velocity update weak form right hand side. And please save the solution into you next and then we just have one last step which is in order to make our simulation truly transient is to advance in time and that just means we say that u previous is going to be u next 
because if we are then in the next iteration of our loop, u previous is going to be the solution that we got out in the first step. So last one is going to visualize, and I want to have this interactively, and we're going to use a convenience routine from Phoenix, which is phoenix.plot on u next which handily gives us a vector plot, so a quiver plot, and it is writing in the buffer of matplotlib, so we can modify that with matplotlib, but I just want to have it as is. And in order to make that interactive, we have to draw it, and then we have to pause for a bit, so maybe 0.02 seconds, and of course there's a typo, and then we have to clear the figure. And that should be it. Let's see if we made any mistakes by bringing up the terminal and then executing Python lit driven cavity. And here we see it is preparing. And here we go. Perfect. It works. So we see it is preparing the variational problem and solving it. We have some progress. It's rather slow. We will look at the speed up in a second. But if we look at the solution qualitatively, you probably follow that, that we get this structure that we create vertices here maybe let me make that a little bigger and we see that on the top we have our velocity boundary condition which is moving to the right and then by the effects of diffusion and convection we are creating a vortex here which center is approximately here and as you see here the solution has almost already reached a steady state and that's the expected behavior of the lit driven cavity that I mean, of course, the time it takes until the steady state greatly depends on the viscosity. But here in that case, we more or less reached this steady state where we see this vortex. And if we were to draw streamlines, we would get circular streamlines. So let me interrupt that for a second. And I now want to talk a little bit about ways on speeding up the computations. And the problem, as you have probably seen in the printout, is that in each iteration it says solving linear variational problem. And for this, Phoenix under the hood first assembles all the linear matrices and then solves it. Whereas large parts of the assembly is kind of repetitive because the system matrix does not greatly change in between the iterations. So we could pre-compute it. Well, let's do that and say right before the time step to pre-compute the system matrices and then let's say because they do not greatly change. So we will get a momentum assembled system matrix and we will just use phoenix.assemble super straightforward and then we will use the left hand side. Because I told you the left hand side is this part of the weak form which contains the trial functions. And then we have to assemble the discretized form of our system matrix, which then kind of has the globalized way of discretizing our spatial derivatives. Then we also have a pressure Poisson assembled system matrix, which is phoenix.assemble on the pressure Poisson weak form left hand side. And we have a velocity update assembled system matrix, which is phoenix.assemble on the velocity update weak form left hand side. And now we have to change the interface here a little bit because we have to manually prescribe our boundary conditions. And we also have to reassemble the right hand side in each iteration because that's the one that changes mostly also because that's the one that contains the informations from the previous iterations in time. So we have to constantly update that. So we will have a momentum assembled right hand side, which is just phoenix.assemble on the momentum weak form right hand side. And as said, we can't just do that once before the time iteration because that greatly changes in between iterations. And then we have to apply our boundary conditions. And I just want to use a list comprehension here in order to apply both boundary conditions in our velocity boundary conditions list by using square brackets and then say bc dot apply on the momentum assembled system matrix and the momentum assembled right hand side for bc in velocity boundary conditions. So it's going to take both the stationary wall and the moving wall, apply the boundary condition. And this makes some 
yeah, from a practical perspective, this makes some small changes in the system matrix and some small changes in the right hand side, but we shouldn't worry about that. Phoenix does this for us in the background. And then this interface changes here a little bit. So instead of having this equality sign here, we're going to have the system matrix. So momentum assembled system matrix. And then we also can't use the utentative anymore because we're not working in this higher level interface of Phoenix where we consider functions as variables. But now we kind of have discrete decrees of freedom and we can access those by saying utentative dot vector. And what Phoenix will do is it will use the assembled system matrix and save the result into this vector. And then of course, we also have to use the momentum assembled right-hand side for the linear system of equations. Well, then let's have a similar thing for the pressure. We will have the pressure Poisson assembled right-hand side, which is Phoenix dot assemble pressure Poisson weak form right-hand side. And then as before, we will use the pressure Poisson assembled system matrix, we have to save in p next dot vector, and we use pressure per song assembled right hand side. Okay, last but not least, let's do the same thing for our velocity correction. So we will have velocity update assembled, and then right hand side by saying phoenix dot assemble the velocity update weak form right hand side. And then we have the matrix here, velocity update assembled system matrix, unext dot vector, and then velocity update assembled right hand side. And hopefully if we didn't make any mistakes, that should give us a small speed up. So let's re-execute the lit driven cavity and we see probably I did a mistake. Okay, of course, um, phoenix dot assemble, we should be using the weak form here. That was wrong. So we have momentum weak form right hand side okay i hope that fixes the problem let's rerun and here we see and also does not again always say this with solving variational problem and we have mm, probably more or less a minor speed up here but at least we don't get this ugly printout so let's close the simulation once again and now we make some small adjustment to the linear solver because the big problem in each finite element solution is solving a linear system of equations it's a standard problem linear algebra there are a thousand ways to do that and for some mathematical problems especially with regards to partial differential equations certain methods are better than others and we can guide phoenix by saying what it should be using and we want to solve the momentum equation using a gm rest solver which is a good way for these particular structure that appear here and i want to use an ilu preconditioner which is amazing for fluid flow then for the pressure per song problem which is the tougher problem in this particular simulation we're going to use gm rest as well and i want to use an amg an algebraic multi-crit preconditioner if you have issues because it might not be installed on your machine you can also just leave that out so i'll just bring that back so amg for algebraic multiprit and then here we will use the same options so gmres and ilu let's save that and rerun it and see what kind of an impact that has and here we go oh that's uh, about three times as fast I mean, probably the interactive visualization is also taking a lot of time here, but at least we're making substantially faster simulation. And that's just by changing a couple of lines of code. So that's again, we see the steady state of our simulation with the vortex being created. And that's the expected outcome of the lit-driven cavity. So that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to download the code with the link in the video description and play around with it. Maybe you have an extension, then open a pull request on GitHub leave a comment if something is unclear. A big thanks to all the Patreons of the channel. If you also want to support my vision of free education on these advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. If you enjoyed that video, then consider subscribing to the channel. There are more Phoenix tutorials, more partial differential equation, and maybe you also like machine learning. And of course, also give a thumbs up to the video if it helped you. Here you will now see similar videos, and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.